Hey, good day, it's Presso. Thanks for hanging out with me in the workshop today. Now this is episode 12 of building the Titan model aircraft engine. Now if you're new here, there's a playlist up above there now. You can go back and check out all the previous content on this build. Also, if you are new here, my channel is about more than just making model aircraft engines. I do a bit of everything. Uh, this is really about encouraging people to get into the workshop and make things. So check out the videos. I think there's over 150 or thereabouts, and there's sure to be something there that will interest you. Now, today we're going to have a go at a process called normalizing, and uh, we're going to do this on this little cast iron piston that I made for this engine. Now this was machined from a piece of stock called Dura Bar. It's a continuously drawn cast iron bar stock. But in the process of doing that machining, uh, it releases stresses in the material. And if that's not addressed, this part will distort at a later stage. So what we're going to do is to heat this up to red hot. And we're going to hold it at that temperature for about 10 minutes and then allow it to cool down slowly. Now, because of the carbon content in cast iron, which is very high, if you were to heat this part up and then cool it quickly, it will chill and it will go glass hard and it will be almost impossible to machine. So the way I'm going to do this is put it into my foundry furnace. We're going to heat it up until it's a dull red, hold it there, and then we're going to allow the residual temperature in the furnace to stop this from cooling quickly. Now it's probably important that we don't put it directly into the flame in the furnace as well. So I'm going to pack it with some fire brick uh, to shield it from the direct flame and then we'll just keep an eye on it and allow it to cool down. Now, some good news. The patents for this engine have come to light. Now I knew that the designer of the engine, George Ginevro, had sold the patents but I didn't know who owned them. The person who has them now got in touch with me and asked me if I was interested in making a short run of castings. Now I politely declined because that's not what I do, this is just a hobby for me and I really don't want to make any money out of it. But there may be somebody out there who has casting facilities and is interested in doing a short run of castings for other people. Now a lot of people have asked if the castings are still available and uh, I'd really like to see this work out for those people. So let me know in the comments if you would like to purchase the patents and uh, maybe we can make this a reality. Now the patents that he has are for the crankcase and also he has a patent for making the core for the crankcase and a patent for making the bulkhead mount. Now as far as I know he doesn't have the patent for the cylinder head but you really don't need that. You can make that from aluminium bar stock which is what I did. So yeah, let me know and uh, it would be really great if we can get some more castings out there for the engine building community. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get on and we're going to do the, uh, the next processes on the piston and hopefully make that fit this cylinder liner. Doesn't fit at the moment, but that's a good thing <laughs> because that's what we're going to do today. Okay, there's the interior of the furnace. Now in the bottom of the furnace there's a sort of a raised plinth and that's where the crucible normally sits. I'm going to put the piston off to one side so it's not directly in front of the flame. I'm also going to preheat the interior of the furnace so it's already pretty hot. And when we put the piston in, it'll heat up fairly quickly uh, because I want to minimize the chance of oxide forming on the outside. And uh, we'll just monitor it, keep an eye on it. But uh, let me get this lit up and then we'll come back when it's sort of a good uh, medium red heat inside. Okay, it may not show up on the camera, but the inside of that uh, bottom section of the furnace now is sort of a medium red heat. And I was going to put the piston in there. So what I've done is uh, put a piece of steel rod through the gudgeon pin or the wrist pin hole there, just to prevent any scale on the inside of that. And I'm just going to grab it by the top of the baffle and put it on top of that piece of um, refractory in the bottom of the furnace. Now I'm going to place it over to one side so that it's not directly in the path of the flame. So we're just going to give it that sort of radiant indirect heat and uh, let's go.
10 minute mark now so shortly I'm going to switch the gas off and then I'm going to put a crucible on top of the furnace there to close off that vent and then we'll just let it cool down slowly. Now the camera makes it look a lot hotter inside than it really is. It's sort of like a dull red and you might be able to see that this in there is sort of a uniform red colour but it's not got any hot spots anywhere. So uh, I'm going to turn the burner off now and we'll just let it cool down. Alright, and you see there that it's sort of got, it looks really red, uh, but it's not. <laughs> so I'm going to cover this up now. Okay, so we're just going to leave that now, uh, probably an hour or two. And by the time I come back from afternoon tea, we can sort of take the crucible off and just open the lid of the furnace. But again, we're just going to let it cool down naturally. Uh, what we don't want to do is induce any thermal shock at this point. Okay, it's actually the next day I decided to leave this overnight. I came back after about two or three hours and the interior of that furnace was still really, really hot. Um, certainly too hot to put my hand in there. So let's have a look. All right. Well, there's certainly no flaking oxide on the surface of that metal. Um, it's sort of got a dull charcoal gray color all over. But the surface on it looks really good actually. Let's see if that pin will come out. Right. Even that pin doesn't show any signs of blistering. It's still relatively clean. So I'm happy with that. So it could be that the interior of that furnace was a sort of a reducing atmosphere. Not a lot of oxygen, so it's protected the metal from getting that, uh, that flaky oxide coating on it. Okay, we're gonna get this in the lathe now. We're gonna finish turn the outside diameter to within say a hundredth or two hundredths of a millimeter of its finished size, and then we'll do some, uh, I'm actually not gonna lap it. <laughs> I'll show you another method. Okay, this is the technique it recommends in the build notes for uh, finishing the piston. So this is a mandrel. It's been machined so that the inside of the piston skirt will fit over that larger diameter there. And this spigot on the end goes up inside that slot where the connecting rod will go. And it just slides on like that. And this is a little aluminium piece that will keep pressure against the crown of the piston to force the piston onto that mandrel. So this is the aluminium piston I made a while ago. Here's the cast iron one. And when I made this yesterday, it slid on there quite nicely and it still does so that's probably a good thing <laughs> uh, certainly the um, if that had been really distorted by the heat treatment it wouldn't go on there so what we can do now is use this little uh, aluminium pin against the crown of the piston and that will keep pressure on it and keep it engaged on that mandrel so this technique is called pressure turning and it relies on a combination of friction and pressure against the mandrel to make sure that this part continues to spin under load. So um, just turn that over by hand a bit while we tighten up the tailstock. That's all good. Now I'm going to use a six millimeter round high speed steel cutter that's been ground and honed. This is one of those diamond tool holders and it will accept quarter inch square uh, high speed steel or uh, quarter inch or six millimeter round. So this will give me a nice broad contact area while we do the machining here. Now, I had a bit of a crisis of confidence this morning. I was doing some reading about using diamond lapping compound on cast iron, and I've read some conflicting reports. Some say that it's fine. Others say that the diamond grip will embed in the cast iron. Now remember, I did the liner, the cylinder liner with diamond honing compound, and uh, when I went to fit this aluminium piston, it was scuffing. So I would polish it, put it into the liner, and when it came out, would, I could see the scuff marks in it. So now I'm sort of paranoid that maybe I've got diamond uh, paste embedded in that liner. Now I did read that you can use an ultrasonic cleaner, and that will remove the diamond, but um, I have my doubts. Um, so maybe I've screwed up there. The only good thing is that this engine is really a museum piece. I'll get it to run, I hope, and if I can run it a few times, that's as much as it's going to do. 
But if you were doing one of these engines and you wanted it to be a running engine and use it in a model, you might be better off to use aluminium oxide, uh, which breaks down and it doesn't embed in the, the metal. So um, let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, if I've messed up, <laughs> there's no going back. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can get it to run and if it does, if it does scuff the cast iron, it'll, well, it'll run. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead now and see if we can get this machine to size. Okay, here's the tool that I've made for doing this final sizing on that piston. Now it's just two pieces of wood held together with a hinge at the top there. This was actually clamped in the vise of the milling machine and I drilled and bored that diameter hole there. And that's the same diameter as the piston plus the thickness of a piece of 400 grit wet and dry paper. And the idea is that when we clamp this over the piston, we can put consistent pressure on that 400 grit wet and dry. Now you could just run the lathe at high speed and just wrap the wet and dry around the piston and just sort of work away at it like that. The problem with that is that it nearly always rounds over this edge. So as you pull on the wet and dry paper you're putting pressure on it and it wants to deflect and conform and come around that edge there. It also tends to wear more off the top and bottom edge than in the center and you could end up with a situation where it's sort of tight in the middle and it's not sealing at either end. With this technique here, you're able to get fairly consistent pressure. Now I've actually seen a tool like this being used on uh, luxury uh, motor car engines. Uh, saw it being done on the crankshaft journals for a, a high performance engine. And the technician was using this to do exactly the same job that we're doing here. So. Um, I'll set this up and show you. Now, I decided to have a go at it before I turned the camera on and I had this wrapped around and I probably only did it for about 10 seconds just to be sure that it was all going to work. And when I took it off and tried the, the liner, it's actually fitting. So if I put the liner on that way, it, it does go on there, but not by much. So we're very close. If I turn it around and go the other way, it fits a bit further. It actually goes on like that. Now, that's because when I was lapping the liner, I put a bit more work into this end here. So it's probably just slightly bigger than the top of the liner. And what that means is that as the piston comes up the top dead center, its fit becomes tighter and tighter until it's almost a perfect seal at the top. But at the bottom of the stroke, it's sort of a bit more free to run down the, the inside of the liner there. So I think our liner is right. And what we need to do now is just get the piston smooth and get rid of this sort of weird pattern that's in it. Now, I had a look at that um, after I did the, the first bit of sanding on that. And it's sort of like a weird um, corrugated finish, but you can't feel it. It feels perfectly smooth, but I'm not too worried about that it's um, it's really just cosmetic it's the fit and the gas sealing that's more important anyway let me get this set up and we'll do a, a bit just to show you how it works and then we'll move on so we've got the lathe set to run at 130 rpm just put that around there Get everything sort of aligned. Make sure it's not bunched up at all. Okay, I'm just running that over by hand to make sure that nothing's going to catch. Alright, and that 
pattern is still there but it, it certainly feels smooth so um, I'm going to stop there <laughs> um, I can revisit this if I'm not happy with it but I want to sort of put the engine together and check that we can sort of run piston up and down the liner over its full stroke to see what it feels like we can finesse this if necessary a bit disappointed I was hoping to get that surface like a mirror but uh, if I go to that point we're going to make this too loose okay you can see here I put the piston together with its uh, connecting rod and the wrist pin or the gudgeon pin and when we try that in the liner it goes in fairly easily and then it when it gets to this point here and the piston crown is just appearing in that port it starts to get quite firm so that's a good thing and if we keep going I can push the piston in and as it gets toward the top of the liner it starts to get quite firm and I think that's about top dead center there so at that point the the ports have opened with the bottom of the piston uh, exposing that port and you can see here that the crown of the piston is starting to come right up to the top of the liner so in the um, notes it says that you try to arrange this so that the fit gets tighter toward the top which was what we've got and I've been talking to a gentleman named Don Brimer who's built one of these engines and he said that he's made his piston so that it's so tight that you basically got to put a stick in there and push it back out again so that's how that is at the moment so I'm confident that uh, that's where I want it to be at the moment if that was so loose it just fell through there I don't think the engine would run now I'm going to put the engine together and then we're going to lubricate it we'll put some oil in there and we're just going to motor the engine over just spinning the prop and uh, that's going to allow everything to run in uh, the surfaces will start to mate to each other and I'm fairly confident that's going to give me the compression that I need uh, like I say you can always tune it and make it uh, a better fit but you certainly can't put metal back on the piston once you've made it too small. Okay, the next job after we've done this is to work on this section of the crankcase here. And we're going to set this up uh, on a fixture. And we need to drill through this section of the casting here to make the venturi. And we also need to drill through these little bosses here to make uh, a seat for the spray bar. So the spray bar is just a very crude fuel metering device and uh, it uses a needle on a seat and depending on how much you open that needle valve you can control how lean or rich the engine runs okay it's taken two days but I now have a fixture that's going to allow me to position this crankcase on the faceplate of my lathe so I can machine the Venturi in the crankcase so what I've got is a piece of 40 millimeter square aluminium bar stock this face here has been machined at 30 degrees to the center line of this spigot on the end of this block. So the spigot fits inside the back of the crankcase like that and that places the center line of the Venturi and this face here at 90 degrees to each other. So with that sat on the face plate in the lathe I can just drill this directly as long as I can get this in the, the center of my face plate. And the first step uh, to get that done is to make sure that this top face of the crankcase here is parallel to the bottom face of this fixture. So I'm going to do that in the milling machine and then once I lock it in place I've got a piece of 8mm all thread that can screw into the end of that spigot and then I've got a, a little bush that fits inside the bore of the crankcase here and I can lock it all down with a hex nut when that's all locked in place we'll go over to the face plate and we'll get it set up there so that's the next step and uh, I'll just get this apart I am, oh sorry what was that what's this feature here uh, that's called a uh, mistake mistake uh, no a mistake mistake that's it yeah yeah I had to look that up because uh, as you know I hardly ever make mistakes in this workshop
Okay, that's good enough. We'll lock that off there. Okay, this is how this works. So I can lock that fixture down anywhere I want on the faceplate within reason. And in the tailstock, I've got a piece of aluminium stock which is the same diameter as the end of the Venturi casting. So if I can just pinch that hex bolt up lightly and then move the tailstock in a bit, I can sort of visually align the casting with that piece of aluminium stock there. And got to remember, it's just a casting. It's not likely to be round, uh, but we want to get it as close as we can. So that sort of feels about right there. So I'll just lock that hex bolt lightly. And what you should see now is that we can rotate the crankcase and it sort of rotates in line with this section of the Venturi here. Okay, I've got this set as close so I can get it ready for turning now. So this thing here is just a counterweight. Uh, you just add some weight to this side of the faceplate and that offsets the weight of these strap clamps and the fixture and the casting. It's really just uh, trial and error with this. You sort of add some weight, spin the layers, see how it goes and tweak it, add or subtract until it runs relatively smoothly. So at this side here I've got two strap clamps. These are just sort of pushed in against the side of that fixture there and that's just to stop the whole thing from rotating. And we're only drilling a hole here so I'm not expecting that to happen but just want to be uh, as safe as we can there. And I did have to tweak the position of that casting just a fraction. Now I ran an indicator in here and I set my DRO to zero when that indicator was reading zero on the dial and that's it there, thereabouts anyway. So it's about one hundredth off and remember it is a casting so if I rotate that it's sort of the, you know, the dial jumps around a bit. Uh, what I can do then is retract the indicator, spin the lathe 180 degrees, go in again, and then reset the DRO to zero. Uh, that's there or thereabouts, and now I'm about five hundredths off. But once again, it depends on where you place the casting. So when I first did this, it was about 0.2 off, which is a bit too much. So now I've got the more or less the axis of this section of the casting running relatively true. This part here may not be, but we can machine the outside of the casting to get that right. I'd say it's a good idea to spin all of this over by hand. Just make sure you've got clearance. Okay, that was just a pilot drill, but I have to decide now whether I'm going to machine this out to 5 sixteenths of an inch or 3 eighths. If I go to 3 eighths, I've got to put a separate throat piece inside there. If I go to 5 sixteenths, I've just got to bell mouth this end and I can use a solid spray bar in there. So um, I like the idea of having the second uh, or the separate throat piece. It means you can shape it accurately. But that does introduce some issues when you go to drill this cross hole. It's, it has to line up. So, um, uh, decisions, decisions. <laughs> um, I think I'll do it the hard way.
problem here is you've got to drill through the bronze bush on an angle and you've got to make sure you don't hit that M8 all thread. Um, I can't really tell. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to stick my head in there and have a look. Probably have to run that reamer through all the way later. I'm not game to do it yet, but we've got about three quarters of it done. That first taper in there is 45 degrees. I'm going to finish off the outer part here just by a bit of hand scraping and then I'll put another angle down at the bottom of that existing taper just to sort of try and flare that in a bit. It's going to need a bit of hand shaping later on. Okay, second taper there was 67 and a half degrees and I'll split the difference now and put a third one. That'll give me a, you know, sort of like a three-sided bell mouth. Just uh, off camera, I put a, a light chamfer on the very edge of the Venturi, but I want to sort of blend this, uh, this back face here. So I'm going to run a uh, boring bar on the back side, running the lathe in reverse. And I've got the compound set round to an angle. It's just it's awkward because the casting is not symmetrical. Uh, I may have to do a bit of hand filing later on to sort of make it look right. But we'll get a bit of it trimmed off anyway. You can see how it's taking a fair bit off this uh, surface here and nothing off the other side. If I go too far it's going to look stupid. Um, I'll do a little bit more, I think I have to do the rest by hand. Okay, I think I'll uh, quit before I tear a finger off. <laughs> I think that's as good as that needs to be. Off camera, I did a bit of finishing on this section of the casting here. So I still had the crankcase attached to that fixture and I held that in the vise. And I just worked around here with a small needle file and I was blending the cast surface with the machine surface. And because it didn't line up precisely, it was just a bit of hand work to be done on that. Still not finished, uh, it needs a bit of uh, refining of the shape, it's sort of got a weird sort of um, step in it here, but I can work on that. The interior of that Venturi came up really good. Uh, that was a fairly high risk procedure there. Uh, I'd never done anything like that before. And with this thing flying around on that faceplate, uh, there was plenty of potential for things to clash and get caught and so on. But I'm happy that's turned out okay. Now, the other thing I did was I machined up this little uh, brass piece. Now, this is 3 8 of an inch outside diameter, 5 16 on the inside, and that's going to form the throat of the Venturi. So that will eventually get pushed down inside the Venturi there, and the centre of that brass piece will line up with the position of this little projected boss here. And it's just pushed in, there's no, uh, it's not going to be loctited or anything. It's actually held in place by the spray bar. 
So the spray bar fits across the, the interior of that Venturi there from one of these cast bosses to the other and it's uh, got a nut on one side and you can tighten that up. So that will prevent that little brass throat from sliding in and out. Now this will eventually have a flared section at both ends and the narrowest portion will be right at the very center where the spray bar fits through. And the purpose of that is that as the air is drawn through that restricted area, the velocity increases, the pressure drops, and it also acts as a suction to suck the fuel into the uh, combustion chamber. So I didn't do that yet because the next step is to try to drill a cross hole in this and it has to line up with the cross hole in the crank case. Now on the face of it you'd say well that's easy just uh, drill a cross hole there and drill one there it should be fine. The problem is that I have to be sure that the cross hole lines up exactly with that reamed hole in the center of that casting and I've got nothing to, I can check there's nothing I can sort of run an indicator along unless I put a like a piece of steel rod inside that reamed hole and then run indicator along that and that's what I'll have to do because if these two holes don't line up it's just not going to work so I won't do all of the finish work on this part until I'm sure that I've got that right uh, if it doesn't work out I'm gonna have to sort of make a couple of these until I get it correct um, Having said that, if I screw up the position of this hole here, all I can do is actually put this down in place and drill through it. And then it will only fit in one way. But I would prefer to have this so that you can take it out and swap out different throats. So in the notes it says that you can alter the diameter of the inside of that throat, you make it bigger or smaller, and you can use that as a way of tuning the engine. So that's coming up. I'm going to finish up this episode here now and invite you to come back next time. We'll, we'll do that process and see if we can get that right and we'll start work on the spray bar and the needle valve. So that's all to come up in the next episode. So thanks for watching today. Now I'm going to leave you with a little uh, nature documentary that you might enjoy. Uh, those of you who live in Australia, this is not going to be <laughs> terribly exciting for you. Uh, but if you live overseas and you haven't seen this before, it's, uh, I think you'll find it interesting. So. As I say, thank you for joining me today. Uh, catch up with you on the next episode. Yeah, and thanks for watching and enjoy the documentary. This is a, a big eastern grey kangaroo. These are wild kangaroos and they feed in this paddock next door to our block of land. And uh, these things are magnificent animals. Uh, they're big and they're strong. If he stood up on his hind legs, he'd be taller than I am. And if they're threatened, uh, what they tend to do is stand up as tall as they can and display their chest muscles and their forearms which are huge and there have been reports of these animals uh, if they're cornered they can attack or at least defend themselves I've also read about them uh, drowning dogs in dams so if they're attacked by dogs they'll lure the dog into the water and they'll hold the dog under the water until they drown it <coughs> If they attack a human, they'll grab you around the neck and they'll use that massive tail as an anchor point and then they'll kick their, their hind legs into your abdomen and uh, the claws on those hind legs are razor sharp and they can disembowel a man. So, um, they're beautiful to watch. We love seeing them here, but they are, they are definitely wild animals.